Hi, welcome to our channel Globe. Today we will find out about impacts of climate change in different countries, climate migrations and what can we do about this. Let's get started. When we're talking about the effects of climate change, will it actually affect every country in the same way or is it somewhat different? It's very different. <laughs> um, we may be starting to be conscious of the fact that climate change has an impact. We're seeing that, for example, in drought, in the fact that there's less snowfall in the winter, um, the winds that we've had this year, for example, um, as a result of more energy being in the atmosphere, driving strong winds and those kinds of storms. So we're starting to see those impacts. But this is, this is really just the beginning for us. Whereas if you look at some other countries, they've been experiencing impacts for far longer. So 10, 15 years ago, we were looking at uh, drought, extreme weather, flooding in, for example, sub-Saharan Africa, and it was wiping out uh, food crops for people in places like Malawi and Zimbabwe. Um, and so they've been experiencing the impacts for far longer and been dealing with these climate change impacts for far longer. And what we do know, um, two weeks ago, the IPCC Working Group 2 report came out on impacts, adaptation, the, the societal impacts of climate change. And what we do know is that the impacts are really... Um, really different depending on countries and it tends to be those countries in what we would call the global south, the poorer countries, that are already experiencing far greater impacts of climate change and because of their, their sort of their poverty levels, the lack of infrastructure that they already have there, they're also in a worse place to adapt and deal with that. They don't have the infrastructure or the, the capacity to adapt to those greater impacts as well. So it's, it's definitely not a uniform impact across the globe. And actually climate change, we often talk about as being a question of justice. Um, there are people in the world who will not notice climate change for a long time to come. And there are people in the world who are already experiencing devastating impacts of climate change. Recently, there have also been talks about uh, climate cost migration, that people from these poorer regions are trying to move somewhere else where they can have kind of better life, less affected by climate. Honestly, we're, we're going to see this more and more. Um, I think that we've probably underestimated um, the role of climate in existing migration patterns that we've already seen. What we do know is that for example, climate change is thought to have played a role in the crisis in Syria. And that, of course, we, we saw the impacts in migration of that and people coming to Europe. And Europe struggled with, with people coming here. The political response caused, caused the struggle. We're going to see this more and more. Um, people are going to move if they cannot produce food, if they cannot get water, and if, it, if the temperatures are unlivable people are not going to stay where they are. People are going to move. Uh, one of the key questions that we have in Europe coming up, and this is a political and a social question, is how do we respond to that? Um, migration is going to happen and we have a choice here in Europe. Do we close the doors and pretend that it's not our problem and keep people out? Or do we find a way of integrating people and responding better to the challenges of migration? When we look at a few years ago that the IPCC had a special report on um, the dangers of exceeding 1.5 degrees of, of warming and one of the things that they highlighted was the, the impact to our societies and the chance of civil unrest if global temperatures continue to increase and far exceed 1.5 degrees. And there's all kinds of drivers for that civil unrest, for example, conflicts over food, water, resources. But one of those drivers is migration. And that's not to say that migration is a bad thing. I'm actually of the idea that we should be opening the doors and integrating people in. But we can, we can cause conflict by the way that we react to migration. 
And if we react to migration by closing the doors and telling people to stay away, then we're going to have civil unrest because we, we are going to be seeing millions of people leaving uninhabitable areas over the next few decades. Um, if we close the doors and tell them they can't come here, that's going to cause problems. And instead, we as a, as a society, one of the ways that we need to adapt is to think about how do we integrate people? How do we shift our societies and our mindsets to be able to cope with these mass movements of people? What are some other effects that the climate change can have on Europe? One of the biggest things that we're seeing at the moment is drought. The drought that's happening in highly productive agricultural landscapes is quite a concern. That gives me sleepless nights, if I'm honest. <laughs> um, so it's going to get harder to produce food um, in Europe. There are parts of Europe that potentially in the short term will do better. Like, for example, southern Sweden will be able to produce more food in the short term because of a, a more moderate climate for them. But over the long term, that's... <laughs> And long term, I'm talking like 50 years, not like centuries. Um, in the longer term, that's going to also have problems with producing food. The other problem that we've got is sea level rise. Um, so coastal areas, as the ice caps melt, sea levels are going to go up and we're going to be seeing much more flooding of coastal areas. So places like the Netherlands, <laughs> they're all low-lying areas, but even I mean, big parts of the UK are likely to be underwater. Um, and all across, basically anywhere that's low-lying along the coast is going to have a problem. But that also, the changing rainfall patterns, um, when we talk about changing rainfall patterns, we, we often talk about, um, okay, there's, there's going to be more rain, but it's, or, or in sometimes there's going to be less rain and sometimes there's going to be more rain. And it's that change in pattern that's the problem that, Sometimes we're going to have drought and other times we're going to have a short period of time where there is a huge amount of rain and that's, we just can't deal with that. Our rivers are going to overflow, the streets are going to flood. We've just been seeing this in Australia over the last couple of weeks, right, where they have had catastrophic flooding because of a sudden inundation of a huge amount of rain in a short period of time. And that, that is going to be a problem for us here in Europe. And for me, the question is, how do we how do we adapt to that we we have these cities we have infrastructure in place we have people who live their lives in in a very sort of static way we are attached to places and property and infrastructure and how do we very rapidly now change that so that we can respond to flooding to drought to to this incoming of people these changes and do so in a way that is good for us as a society. Um, and hopefully in a way that also mitigates further changes so that we can limit the amount of damage that we're having to respond to. What are the ways we all can do something about climate change, like as an individual or as a whole society? This is really the, the key question from, from my point of view is what can we do? When I talk about climate change as being, it, it's a systemic problem. It's driven by our economy, by the way that we live, by our politics. And so then it's a bit unfair to say that individuals have to change because actually we all know that there's a very limited amount that we can do as individuals. And we're all trapped into certain behaviours by the system. So we talked earlier about sort of rural people with no bus service of course they're trapped in car use and so then if i then say to them oh well you shouldn't be driving that's unfair <laughs> um, there's there's not much that they can do about that other than stay home not go to work and not access services right so so they pretty much have to drive but what we can all do as individuals is make every decision that it is within our power to make in the most environmentally friendly way. So if you have access to public transport, use it. Um, if you have a decision about whether you fly or take the train or even not travel at all, <laughs> then make, make that decision. Take the train or if you really don't need to travel, don't travel. If you can, buy food that is more sustainably 
produce. Try not to buy the stuff that's in plastic packaging. Try not to buy processed food. All of these sort of micro decisions all add up to make a big difference in the world if we all do them. They also demonstrate that as a society, we're serious about this. We want things to change. And that pressure can lead companies and the governments to change the way that they're behaving as well. So, for example, if there is enough demand for uh, sustainably produced food, then companies are going to respond to that demand and meet that demand and produce the things that we want to buy. If governments are seeing that actually people aren't driving their cars, they're all taking public transport, then they can respond to that in the way that they make decisions on the kinds of infrastructure that they fund and support and the services that they provide to us. So as individuals, we have a lot of power in our, in our micro decisions, in, in the way that we live our everyday life. But <laughs> the biggest change will come from decision makers, from the companies, from the politicians that really create these infrastructures and create the opportunity spaces that we have for making changes. And so the best things that we can do are collective actions. So that can be, for example, I often talk about the power of protest and demonstration. That can be as simple as taking to the streets on a Friday with the Fridays for Future movement mm -hmm and being present and showing that you also want change. And as we've seen across Europe, as those numbers grow and grow, it changes the political conversation that's being had. Um, the Fridays for Future movement has achieved in a very short period of time what scientists have not achieved in the last 50 years. Um, so it's a really powerful movement. So, so join these demonstrations. But also you can do more tangible things close to home. So. Uh, join collective organizations that are doing small things for, for change. That might be, for example, joining an association around your school or village or community that's uh, doing things for the community. And that might be having a voice on asking for trees to be planted to produce shade in your community. Or it might be, for example, pushing for a um, a no car area around a school so that people can walk to school safely and not be breathing in traffic fumes. And so these collective actions as well can have can unlock change for, for multiple individuals.